This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. So just to uh, a brief review of what constitutes a task C or task D lesion, um, hopefully you can read this all in the back there uh, in terms of the uh, definition of a task C lesion, uh, the most severe of which is uh, bilateral common iliac artery occlusions. And the task consensus uh, recommendation for treatment of this lesion is open surgery for a good risk patient. However, if the patient has significant comorbidities and uh, the operator has a high success rate, then you could consider endovascular uh, treatment. Uh, for the more severe task uh, D lesions, as illustrated here, uh, the consensus is that surgery, surgery, open surgery is treatment of choice for a type D lesion. So um, why are then we talking about endovascular treatment of TAS C and TAS D lesions if the recommendations are to approach these with an open surgical approach? Well, I think that um, the arguments are that you can achieve a high technical success rate in treating this, these lesions with a very modest morbidity. Uh, as we've alluded to in the first morning session, there are always um, evolution of endovascular techniques. Uh, things are getting easier. Uh, uh, technologies are getting better, and people are getting more experienced with uh, using these devices. Another argument is that when this technique does fail, uh, reinterventions can be done percutaneously, um, and that the secondary patency rates are actually comparable to open surgery. And finally, if you fail by approaching these lesions with an endovascular first approach, that person is usually still a candidate for conventional surgical therapy. So if your initial outcome doesn't meet your expectations, not much is lost. I think if you're going to tackle these advanced uh, aortoiliac uh, lesions, you have to be prepared um, to uh, approach these from uh, any number of uh, access sites, usually um, one arm and, and two groins, I think, uh, will be prepped. I think the most common approach is to um, attack this through an ipsilateral retrograde approach, but I would say that probably in about 50 or 60 percent of those cases, you're going to need to either uh, get bilateral femoral access or additionally brachial access. And, you know, most of these techniques. Uh, most of these lesions can still be treated using a subintimal angioplasty technique, I would say probably 60 to 70 percent, and the rest of the time um, reentry devices or CTO devices will be needed. The potential complications, vessel wall perforation, dissection, avulsion of the vessel from the aorta, embolization, and then access site complications are fairly frequently encountered with these uh, tough-to-treat lesions, and I think you have to be prepared um, in terms of your, your stock, your armamentarian of things to uh, treat these complications with. So this is a case, um, a fairly straightforward case, a common left, uh, I'm sorry, a chronic left common iliac artery occlusion. Uh, because there is a, a stump of the proximal left common iliac artery, this was initially uh, approached through a, a, a right femoral approach. You can see here, um, initially, uh, we were unable to cross from a right femoral approach, so we uh, uh, obtained left femoral artery access uh, under ultrasound guidance. With a Cumpy catheter and glide wire, we were in a subventimal plane and could not get back into the true lumen, uh, despite multiple uh, attempts. And this is what we found. And, you know, when you see this, I mean, I immediately get nervous. I don't like to make, you know, a big dissection plane in the aorta. And, you know, I think most people would, would quit potentially at this point and say it's not doable. But I do think it just depends on how hard you want to try. Most of these lesions can be treated successfully. A reentry device was used in this case, allowing successful uh, entry into the aortic true lumen. Balloon expandable kissing stents were then placed into the common iliac arteries and an additional self-expanding stent into the left common iliac artery with a pretty good result. Here's another case. Uh, this is an obese uh, woman with lots of uh, medical comorbidities and a colostomy. You can see here she has bilateral common iliac artery, I'm sorry, 
bilateral iliac artery occlusions, a right common iliac and a left external iliac occlusion, and also bilateral SFA occlusions. Uh, she was referred over to us because she had an unsuccessful attempt at um, recanalizing the iliac arteries through a femoral approach, and so this was uh, attempted through left brachial access as a start, and um, we could not uh, cross this lesion from a left brachial approach. So then uh, combined left brachial and right femoral access uh, was tried. Uh, again, um, we were in a subintimal plane and unable to enter the true lumen. And so a reentry catheter was successfully used from the right femoral approach and uh, gained access into the true lumen. And here you see we're all set up to place uh, stents into the iliac arteries. So kissing eye cast uh, covered stents were placed into the iliac arteries, the common iliac arteries, and then a uh, wall stent was placed into the right external iliac artery. And here you see here there's a, obviously a rupture in the right common iliac artery, and this was treated by placement of a covered stent. So I think for endovascular treatment of advanced aortoiliac uh, artery disease, uh, it's not really a question of can we do it, but really should we be doing it. So in the next few slides, I'm going to present the data that are available that specifically reviews um, outcomes for these advanced lesions. Uh, they're not, none of these are randomized trials. They consist of a, a systemic <laughs> review, a meta-analysis, and then a large case series, but um, it's the best that we have so far. So this is a systematic review um, that was published in 2010. It consists of 19 non-randomized studies with uh, over 1,700 patients. 1,300 of whom had extensive aortoiliac occlusive disease, so 1,300 patients with type C or D lesions. These are all single center results, all retrospective analyses, and all tertiary care referral centers. In terms of the technical success rates, they're pretty good. So in all of the studies, they were reported, and they ranged between 86 to 100 percent. Obviously, there was a lot of heterogeneity within each of these studies that we couldn't control for. The most common reasons for technical failure were inability to cross the occluded segment, thrombosis after recanalization, and iliac artery rupture. Uh, there was zero perioperative and 30-day mortality in 12 of these studies, and in the other seven studies, the mortality rate ranged from 1% to 6.7%. What about primary patency? Uh, one year primary patency, you can see on the left uh, hand of the slide, uh, 70 to 97 percent. One year secondary <laughs> patency was better at 88 to 100 percent. And then there are only a few uh, studies that uh, follow these patients long enough to gain four or five year patency uh, data. Uh, the primary patency rate in those studies uh, after four to five years was 60 to 86 uh, percent, and a secondary patency rates at the five year mark of 80 to 98 percent. This was a, uh, another meta-analysis that was published just within months uh, after that first study that I mentioned. I think that these, the analysis was obviously, uh, the question was being asked simultaneously and this was just published a little bit later. And basically it was asking the same question but with fairly, you know, different inclusion and exclusion criteria. So this meta-analysis included 16 articles with nearly 1,000 patients with TAS-C or TAS-D iliac lesions that were treated with endovascular therapy. And just to give you a sense with the overlap, eight of these 16 articles were included in the previous systemic uh, review uh, that I just presented. They had to have a minimum of 10 cases per study um, and had to report data on immediate technical success uh, and primary patency. And when they looked at the pooled estimate for technical success in these 16 uh, studies, they found this to, rank, to be 93% uh, with a primary patency of 89% at 12 months. And here you see when they broke it down by task uh, subtype and whether a um, policy of primary or selective stenting was used, the technical success was slightly better in the task C lesions compared to the task D lesions, and slightly better in um, when they did primary stenting versus selective stenting, but these results were not statistically significantly different. Similarly, uh, for 12-month primary patency, slightly better for the task C lesions, but not significantly different, and again, um, the primary stenting group uh, fared better in terms of one-year primary patency compared to the selective stented group, but again, not significantly different. And not to be outdone, this was the most recent um, 
uh, case series that was uh, published. A subset of um, their results were included in the uh, two uh, analyses uh, just mentioned. Uh, I think they, <laughs> they basically looked over this time period to identify um, 1,712 procedures. If you, if you note, the biggest series to date was 17 and 11 um, uh, case cases, and so I think they stopped after they got more than that uh, last systematic review. So anyways, it was in 1,184 patients, and it was uh, specifically lesions in the distal aorta and iliac arteries. Uh, their primary endpoint was one-year uh, duplex-based primary patency uh, and with the secondary <coughs> endpoints. And what they found was their 30-day mortality was about 1%. They had a mean follow-up of a little over three years. Um, they found no difference uh, in their 12- and 24-month uh, restenosis rates uh, or in uh, their primary and secondary patency rates. And it didn't differ among the different task subgroups. Uh, they also looked to see whether complex interventions in the distal aorta or the aortic bifurcation differed uh, between the overall cohort and found that those outcomes were no different. The only thing that they uh, did see was when they looked at a combined outcome of freedom from restenosis, amputation, or surgery, those who had task A and B lesions did slightly better compared to those with task C and D lesions, uh, and this uh, finding was uh, statistically significant. So, you know, all of these studies, um, they span quite a long period of time. They start back in the 90s. They end in the mid-2000. Uh, they used a variety of stents. Uh, actually, in that last series, um, a lot of the task D lesions were treated with self-expanding stents. And so you might ask, well, maybe, again, we are lagging in terms of um, technology, and would a covered uh, stent be better in this location and yield better patency results than uh, bare metal stents? The benefit of covered stents include a reduction in intimal hyperplasia. There's also a thought that maybe they're less thrombogenic than a bare metal stent. And there are numerous case, small case series that res, uh, demonstrate promising results. There's only one randomized uh, trial, the COBEST trial, which was performed in Australia, the covered versus balloon expandable stent trial. And in this series, 168 iliac arteries in 125 patients with task B, C, and D lesions were um, randomly assigned to a covered uh, balloon expandable stent versus a bare balloon expandable stent. Uh, and they followed these patients for uh, up to 18 months. And here you can see that um, in terms of the freedom from binary restenosis, there was a significantly uh, different outcome between the uh, covered stent versus the bare stent, and this favored uh, the, cover the covered stent. When you looked at freedom from stent occlusion, although there was a trend towards the covered stent having better results, uh, it was not significantly different. They then um, looked at freedom from binary restenosis based on task group, and I apologize, there is, um, I think, a typo in, in the syllabus. I think I wrote in there that there were more task D lesions in the bare stent group. It's actually there are more task D lesions in the covered stent group. So when you look at freedom from binary restenosis in these subgroups, actually the, the task C and D group, there was a significant benefit in those who received a covered stent um, compared to those who received a bare metal stent, and um, that difference was not seen in the task B group. So I think it's promising. Um, I think that it makes sense uh, to use covered stents to treat these lesions. Uh, there's another randomized trial that's uh, currently um, underway in um, the Dutch Iliac Stent Trial or the DISCOVER trial, and it's basically the same study uh, as COBEST. Um, probably more patients will be enrolled, I think, in this study, but it's using the, um, the same covered stent, the uh, Advanta V12 PTFE covered stent. And in both of these trials, they're going to be randomized to um, uh, a balloon expandable uncovered stent. So there's no, there's no single uncovered stent that's going to be used in either of these trials because there are several that are available um, for treatment. So should we be treating uh, these extensive aortoiliac occlusive disease lesions with uh, endovascular therapy first, or should we stick with the consensus guidelines that task C and D should be approached um, with an open surgical approach? In terms of the comparison of techniques, we don't have any head-to-head -head comparison. We can only, you know, present what we know based on non-randomized uh, studies that look at both of these separately. 
I think that with open surgery, there, the studies have shown that there's a higher mortality than with endovascular pair for these lesions, and that there is higher morbidity, which is more significant. Um, open surgery, though, hands down, still wins the primary patency argument. Um, primary patency uh, at one year, at five year, at 10 years is better than endovascular repair. However, uh, I think that this may change with regular use of covered stents. We still don't have very long follow-up with the uh, endovascularly treated um, patients. I think that the secondary patency is actually uh, close um, in the endovascular pair group when you compare it to open surgery. Uh, definitely decreased uh, length of stay. And when you think about, you know, how to treat these patients with open surgery, usually you're limited by physiology, whereas an endovascular repair, um, usually it's uh, a limitation by the anatomical constraints of the lesion. So um, in summary, I think that most uh, TAS C and D lesions can be successfully treated. I would say that probably over 90% can be treated. It depends on how hard you want to work and what potential complications you're willing to you know, live through and treat. I would say that you would liberally use covered stents in, this, um, in treating this disease, especially with difficult cases and long segment occlusions. And you know, be prepared for complications. It's usually going to be a rupture or dissection. Um, and as I said before, I think the long-term patency may improve with regular use of covered stents. So I would say that if you do these um, therapies regularly, you have a high success rate and you have a patient with uh, significant comorbidities, I don't think an endovascular first approach is the wrong approach. Um, I think that the data that uh, we have available, although it's not level one data, um, would support um, this approach. Uh, I think that a juxtarenal aortic occlusion probably is um, the TAS D lesion that you don't want to treat with an endovascular first approach. But short of that, I don't think that there's any um, pure anatomic uh, limitations. Obviously, open surgery is still robust, um, a great treatment with excellent primary patency, um, and in the good risk young patient should be the first approach for these types of lesions. Thank you.